How many of you grew up in a home where you were regularly told that you were forgiven? I remember being asked that question uh, a few years back when I was still at the seminary. We were sitting in a classroom, about 25 of us, and it was, so it was normally a class where we talked about how to teach catechism classes, uh, and Professor Geiger brought up the subject about disciplining someone uh, and showing that they're forgiven. And Professor Geiger, he had a whole mess of kids, so he told a story about his own home and how he disciplines his children. I don't remember all the details, but the story went something like this. He was at home with his children, and they were sitting around the dinner table, and he was handing out dessert. And he gave an extra cupcake to one of the younger daughters, and that made the older daughter so upset. She was so upset, she said, Daddy, you already gave them one. And that's when Professor Geiger said, you don't talk to your father that way. You need to go take a time out downstairs. So his oldest daughter went downstairs to take a time out. And after a couple of minutes, Professor Geiger went down the stairs and he talked to his oldest daughter who was in tears. He said to her, do you know why I gave you a time out? And she nodded her head and he said, you can't talk to your father that way. And then he put his arm around her and said, but I forgive you and I love you and Jesus forgives you too. And they went back upstairs. And then he told our class, he said, that's how you discipline a child. You point out their sins and then you tell them that they're forgiven and that they're forgiven because of Jesus. And here's where things get interesting. Then he asked us, how many of you grew up in a household like that, where you were disciplined, but then regularly told that you were forgiven? And we looked around the room, and about five or so raised their hands. Isn't that interesting? Out of a room full of 25 men who are studying to be a pastor, who were exclusively raised in Christian homes, many of which had a father as a pastor, only about five out of the 25 could say they grew up in a home where they were regularly told that their sins were forgiven. And what about you? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight, but did you grow up in a home where you were often told that you were forgiven? I have a feeling, like my seminary classroom, that this church is the same. We grew up in Christian homes, we grew up in Christian households, we liked the idea of the forgiveness of sins, but something about it makes it hard to share. For whatever reason or not, many of us grew up in homes where we weren't used to saying, I forgive you, when somebody sinned against us. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that is, that so many people struggle to say the words, I forgive you? Well, it's because forgiveness is difficult, isn't it? In that moment when somebody hurts you, when they say something to you, they do something that cuts you so deeply, it's hard to forgive them. It's hard to say, I forgive you to somebody else once they hurt you. Instead, it's so much easier to just sweep it under the rug, Pretend it doesn't exist, and just move on. And we are in a sermon series called Go, where we are taking the messages, the blessings of Easter, and sharing it with the world. And the forgiveness of sins is a key part of Christianity. Knowing that we're forgiven through Jesus, we will want to share that forgiveness with other people. But even though forgiveness is a key part of Christianity, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It's never been easy. Tonight we're looking at a letter called 2 Corinthians that was written 2,000 years ago. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a church in Corinth that needed to forgive someone. A little background about the city of Corinth. Uh, the city of Corinth was kind of like uh, modern-day Las Vegas. Uh, it was a big, populous city that had lots of commerce, lots of business going on. Uh, but it was also known for its sin. 
Lots of wild living, that kind of thing going on in Corinth. Uh, if you called somebody a Corinthian back then, uh, it was like a slang term for somebody that uh, was sleeping around. So you wouldn't want to be called a Corinthian because that's what they do in Corinth. All they do is they have these wild parties and it's a sin city. But by God's grace, the Apostle Paul went to Corinth and he was able to plant a church. He was able to preach the message about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and a church was formed. But then Paul had to move on. He helped get this church started, but then he went on to plant more churches in other areas. But when Paul was gone away from that church, he heard that that church ran into many problems. As you can imagine, planting a church in Sin City, uh, there's going to be some messy situations. And in 1 Corinthians, we hear about a messy situation, a terrible situation, an awkward situation. We hear about a man that was part of this church in Corinth who was sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul says, what are you guys doing? The rest of the world doesn't even do that. And they're looking at us as a Christian church, and they see a guy in your church who is sleeping with his father's wife. And to make things worse, the guy wasn't repentant for it either. He was proud in his sin. So Paul had to write a letter to them to help them to discipline to tell them that you need to point out this man's sin. You need to tell him that his faith is in danger. You need to hand him over to Satan, is what Paul said, because he is proud in his sin. So, they did that very thing. They disciplined that man. And in 2 Corinthians, what we're looking at tonight, we get to see the result of that discipline. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent. Not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. So right off the bat, we hear that the church discipline worked. This man who was proud in his sin was now remorseful. The church discipline worked. He was led to repentance. As Paul puts it, the punishment inflicted on him was sufficient. It was enough. The church discipline did the trick. This man was now showing signs of remorse over his sin. And then Paul says this. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. So, Step one, point out the sin. Now, step two comes. Let him know that he's forgiven. This church is now in such a critical position. They finally got around to doing step one, and they disciplined this man. And now comes part two, to show forgiveness. And I have a feeling that if you were a first Corinthian reader, reading this for the very first time, that that would be a very hard thing to do. Could you imagine that? Forgive that guy? That guy who was sleeping with his father's wife? Who gave us all as a church such a bad reputation? You expect us to bring back that guy and let him worship with us and be part of this church? You expect us to forgive him? And simply put, Paul says, yes. Because that's the goal of church discipline. The goal of church discipline is not just to make somebody feel bad. The goal of church discipline is to bring somebody back to Jesus. Somebody who is strayed, now bring them back. This man was doing a proud sin, and so they disciplined him, and he felt remorse, and now Paul says, forgive him. Bring him back in Jesus' name. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So these are the two steps you need to follow. You need to, step one, point out his sin, and now step two, bring him back. And if you don't do that, Satan will outwit us. Satan will outwit us, and I don't want you to be unaware of his schemes. So Paul points out that Satan wants the church to mess this situation up. This is how you discipline a man, and if you don't do it, 
Satan will accomplish his scheme. He tells us not to be unaware of his schemes. And in this section of scripture, I see two schemes that Satan often uses. Two schemes that have to be, do with forgiveness of sins. And I don't want you to be unaware of those two schemes. So he, these are the two schemes that I see in this section of scripture. Sweeping sin under the rug and drowning someone in guilt. These are the two schemes of Satan that we see that he tries to use with the first Corinthians. And he still to this day uses these two schemes of sweeping sin under the rug and drowning someone in guilt. In 1 Corinthians, we see that was the thing they struggled with, to sweep sin under the rug. They had a man in their congregation who was doing a terrible sin, and they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to ruffle feathers. They didn't know what to do, so they just let it go on. They were sweeping sin under the rug. And then, they disciplined this man, and he was remorseful, and now the next temptation they face was to drown him in guilt. To not welcome him back. To not tell him that his sins were forgiven. But with these two schemes, do you see that it's the same result with either one of them? Think about what happens if a church continues to sweep sin under the rug with somebody who is proud in their sin. What's the result? Well, for that man in the Corinthian church, he would have continued to live an unrepentant lifestyle, and his faith would be destroyed, and he would end up in hell. Now what about that second tactic? Drowning someone in guilt. What if Satan was successful in that attack? Well, that man would never have been told that he was forgiven. And he would think to himself that he did something so bad that God could never forgive him, that Jesus' sacrifice was not for him, and in that moment of unbelief, he would be sent to hell. Both of these two schemes of Satan result in somebody getting sent to hell. That's why this is so serious. Those two, same two schemes that Satan used on the Corinthians are the same two schemes that he uses on us today. So what about you? Are you guilty of sweeping sin under the rug? Is there someone in your life who is living an unrepentant lifestyle? Someone living in just a spiritually dangerous situation? And you don't want to talk about it, so you sweep sin under the rug? Maybe it's a sinful habit in your own life that you're taking that sin and sweeping it under the rug? Are you guilty of that? And what about the other scheme? Drowning someone in guilt. Is there someone in your life who sinned against you that you simply won't forgive? Is there somebody that hurt you that you're still harboring anger and bitterness for and you would never consider forgiving them? Is there someone who you are trying to drown in guilt? Satan continues to use these tactics on us. Satan wants to do everything we can, that we mess up this idea of forgiving other people so that there are people out there that have their sins swept under the rug so that they continue to live in unrepentance and so that we continue to drown people in guilt so they think they're so bad that God could never forgive them. Satan continues to use these schemes. So how could we ever forgive? How do we get past those two schemes? How do we actually forgive somebody because so many of you have so many stories about stories of your past where somebody hurt you so deeply, hurt by a loved one, a parent, a spouse, an ex. How could you forgive somebody? How could you possibly forgive the same way God forgives us? Well, in this season of Easter, and we talk about the forgiveness of sins, we have to talk about Jesus, specifically when he rose from the dead. During the last days of Jesus' life, so many people who were close to him hurt him. 
Think about the disciples, those who were closest to Jesus, his closest friends. Judas betrayed him. So many of the disciples abandoned him. Peter denied knowing him. Those closest to Jesus hurt him. But what did Jesus do on Easter? He rose from the grave. He found the disciples who were locked in a room, scared. What's he say to them? Does he say, shame on you? Does he scold them? Does he punish them? Does he say, you guys are done, I'm getting new disciples? Well, he enters that room and says, peace. Peace be with you. Jesus shares a message of peace. A peace that we can only get from the forgiveness of sins. A peace knowing that our, our relationship with God is now restored. A peace knowing that our conscience is clean because of what Jesus has done on the cross. A peace knowing that no matter what happens to us in this life, we have heaven waiting for us because Jesus rose from the grave. That's the peace that Jesus shared. And that's the peace, that's the forgiveness that we get to share with other people. That we get to share those beautiful words of forgiveness to others, even when they hurt us. And that kind of reminds me of my favorite music video, one of my favorite music videos. Uh, in 2018, uh, the rapper Drake put out a song called God's Plan. And in that music video, it starts off by saying, uh, the budget for this video was almost a million dollars. So Drake made this song, and he was told to go film the video, and his record label gave him a million dollars to do it. But then it goes on to say, instead of using that money to film a music video, Drake instead gave it all away. And he filmed himself doing it. And the music video is him going up to families in need and giving them a stack of money. And walking through grocery stores and paying for people's groceries, donating large sums of money to scholarships. Drake took money that wasn't his and shared it to people in need, and he had a blast doing it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have that same opportunity with the forgiveness of sins. God has given us this gift, this gift of forgiveness. We didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it, we didn't do anything to get it, but God just gives it to us, gives it to us as a gift. Forgives us all of our sins. Anything you've ever done wrong, God forgives you. And now, we get to share it. We get to go and take that unique message of forgiveness and share it to other people. And we get to have a blast while we do it as well. This week I've been praying for our church. I've been praying for the families of this church. That the families of our church would be willing to forgive. Parents, this is how you discipline your children. Step one, you point out their sin. Step two, tell them that they're forgiven because of Jesus. And don't skip step two. And so many of you might say, but I didn't grow up in a house that, where you did that. It might sound awkward. I never experienced that. Today's the day where that changes. Today's the day where you say, I forgive you in your home. Those of you who are married, when your spouse does something wrong to you and says, I'm sorry, say, I forgive you. That's not your opportunity to continue to escalate the argument. It's not your opportunity to continue with the name calling. When someone says, I'm sorry to you, you say, I forgive you. And maybe there are some of you out there where that thing, that thing that cut you so deeply, that person who hurt you, uh, it happened years ago, or you don't even have a relationship with them anymore. I pray that today is the day where you let go of those feelings of bitterness, and you forgive whoever hurt you. Because that's what we get to do as Christians. We know that we sinned against God, and at the infinite cost to him, he sent his son to die for us and gives us that gift of the forgiveness of sins. And now, we share with other people. So as a church, let's not sweep sin under the rug. 
Let's not drown someone in guilt. Instead, let's shower all people with the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus. We do this all in his name. Amen. Please stand.